<clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Uh, I want to just uh, throw a shout out there to all those that are listening in India. I know for sure someone's listening from India. Hyderabad right now. Also those possibly in uh, Africa, South Sudan, uh, maybe even um, Uganda. Uh, others in different locations that have... Uh, let me know that they're listening and they hear the devos, whether they listen to the live ones or the recorded ones. I'm not quite sure. I know some are listening even right now. So uh, hit that little like button. Appreciate that. Or if you if you have some love for me, hit the little heart button. If you don't have love, then thumbs up is fine. That's good enough. <laughs> I'll take that over the love. <laughs> uh, if you're in the neighborhood, if you're listening in our community of Harupa Valley, um, like to invite you here to the church at 5383 Martin Street off of Harupa and Martin and 54th there. We're tucked away in the residential area of Old Mariloma there. <coughs> so you're welcome to join us. A neat little <coughs> church that we have here. We have recently remodeled uh, the whole church, have a couple of rooms that we still need to do, but uh, come on by, take a look at this uh, late 1800 building and what, what we have done to it, not just on the outside, but also on the inside. Love to have you here. All right, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's pray. Good morning, Diana. Good morning, Patty. Glad you guys could join us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, and we want to just lift up this study to you. We ask that you would encourage us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Now, your Bibles may have a heading over uh, some of the scriptures here, and it kind of outlines it for you. The New King James uh, outlines verses 1 through 2 as the race of faith. The race of faith. Now, think about that. That, that is talking about our, our life in Christianity and how we live out that life here upon this earth. It's a race. Paul talks about us being in a race, and a race that we are to run to win the prize. Not win the, win the race, but win the prize, the prize that what God has for us. And so it is a race that we're in, and race, it's a long one. It's an endurance race. It's uh, cross country, and it's one that you uh, really need to uh, prepare and uh, expect delays and walls and, and things to happen, but you get back up and you get back into that race of faith. So let's go ahead and look at this as he describes this race of faith, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I just want to look at this one thing uh, here in these two verses, is looking unto Jesus. Uh, um, if I were to look at the Greek, it's probably continually looking unto Jesus. That's that's the verb right there, right? Looking unto Jesus. And we are to continually be looking unto Jesus, who is what? The author and finisher of our faith. He is the one that authored our faith. He is the one that, that um, gave us enough faith so that we would put our faith in Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross. He's the author of it. And it's through him and by him and by none of us at all. But he is also the one that will finish our faith. So it is God who's begun it, and it is God who will finish it. And if he has to carry us, he will carry us through through the other side. We just recently looked at verse uh, or chapter 11, and we saw the record of faith, and we saw all the things that they had gone through in their race of faith. And if we were to go back to the Old Testament and look at each one of those individuals' life, we would see all the struggles they had. Uh, Hebrews 11 just gives us uh, the victory they have in Christ, but 
if you go back and you really look at the life of Samson, for instance, and, and you just uh, read the story, you're just going, wow, what a, what a bipolar guy, <laughs> to use a word. I mean, he was up and down all over the place, and he, he was one that lived like the Corinthians by the flesh and uh, did it his way and didn't surrender to God, and yet, and yet somehow God authored his faith and finished his faith. You know, somehow he was saved at the very end when he offered up his life uh, to destroy the enemy there. So the, the, the author and finisher of our faith, uh, what comes between that is real for us because we're going through it. And we all go through hardships, don't we? We all go through separations. Um, some of you are going through a divorce right now. You don't want to get divorced, but for some reason, your spouse doesn't want to be with you anymore. Your spouse has fallen away from the Lord or you just can't get along. Some of you might be abused. Some of you might have <clears throat> abuse in your life and you just can't get over it. Maybe you've lost someone and you can't get over that. And I don't know if you can ever get over it, but you have to try to be productive as much as you can. So we all have gone through things in our life and, and those are the uh, areas of our life that, that uh, make us who we are or break us even. Uh, but ultimately in the end, it's God who authored and finishes our faith. And so we have to continually put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and hang on to him alone. Trust in the Lord you know, with all of your heart, not just part of your heart, but every bit of your heart, every intent, every thought, every desire, every lust. Trust him with all of that. Trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And that word understanding is talking about your own intellectual ideas and thoughts. But your own ideas and understanding are flawed. They're skewed. Uh, there's something missing there. And so we don't have the resources to understand what's going on in this life. So we have to not lean on our own understanding, but acknowledge Him, that is Jesus Christ, Acknowledge him, and then he will continually direct our path. So what do we need to do there? Surrender. That's it, right? We can't do anything else but just say, okay, Lord, you're in control. I'm going to surrender it to you. So he's the author and finisher of our faith. So we surrender to his will. Amen? Amen. All right. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> uh, New King James outlines verses 3 through 11 as the discipline of the Lord or of, the, of God. Uh, God disciplines. I was just listening to a great message last night on my way home from class. It's like 9.45. And wasn't pleasant when I got to Limonite and they had the on-ramp shut off. So I had to go all the way back past that and go out further in order to come home. <laughs> but be that as it may, uh, this guy did an excellent study and he talked about the balance in our walk with the Lord and how the Lord is one who corrects chastises, disciplines, but he's also one that blesses and encourages and strengthens. The Lord is one that will, will point out the do's, I mean, you know, the don'ts, the do's and the don'ts of our walk, what we do, what we don't do, and the ways we get in trouble and so forth, but he's also the one that points out what we have in Christ Jesus. There's a balance there. And he mentioned uh, the fact that in the 1970s, uh, Christianity, the church was all about the don't do's, you know, you don't, Christians don't do that. Christians don't do this. Christians don't do this. So then all of a sudden there was a, there was a switch, a move from that kind of thinking within the Christian church. And that was the only thinking that was in the Christian church. And this move was then all of a sudden, this is what God's done for us. And so it's not about what we do. It's about what he has done for us. And that shift has gone again to another extreme. So you hear our worship, you hear um, the way Christians talk. It's very tolerable. Uh, they don't judge. You know, uh, it's all about what God has done, and we're children of God. We're children of the King, and and, and it's all true. And then he brought it all together and says, "Look, God is both. It's Christians don't do this. Christians don't do that. But God has blessed us. God has grace. God has mercies." So there's a balance there that we have to have. And it's a struggle because you have to figure out that balance in your own life. And ultimately it comes down to this one thing again, is just surrender your life to God. 
and stay away from those things that are going to harm you in your relationship with God, whether they're idols of some sort or even covetousness, lust, or, and then also realize you are a child of God and God has blessed you with every spiritual gift in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1 and 2 say. So get that balance. And so as we see here, we're going to see that God chastises us, but why? Because he loves us and because we're his children. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. At least you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So he's talking about Jesus, right? Who endured all this hostility uh, from sinners as they crucified him upon the cross. And if we consider how much he suffered, how much will we suffer? Otherwise, we'll get discouraged. And it's easy to get discouraged. The enemy wants us to get discouraged because then we become useless and we don't not fit for the kingdom of God. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, uh, striving against sin. Now, as Paul is writing this, and again, I think Paul is writing this, he's saying this to some of the uh, Hebrew Jewish people. You haven't uh, not yet resisted unto bloodshed, but yet they will shortly. Eighty seventy. Nero's going to come in and just wipe out the temple and kill a lot of Jews in this rebellion, and a lot of them will be dispersed. So some of us have not endured to bloodshed. How many of us have really stepped out in faith to do something that would risk our very lives? Now, some of us have, but yet we still haven't seen the bloodshed. Now, some of us may, in the future here, have to give our lives to the Lord. But when you think about it, we have, not, um, we have not resisted as hard as Jesus resisted, uh, striving against sin. <clears throat> and you have forgotten, and by the way, striving against sin, almost like he's saying here that you're actually fighting against sin, right? Whether it's your sin or whether it's the sin in the world, it's almost like uh, politics. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like to me, you know? If the politicians say that... Uh, we're going to support abortion and we're going to fund it and so forth. We as Christians should strive against that and say, no, abortion is wrong. Uh, Kiana, Kiana West? Key. Key? Kiana Wayne? West. Oh, yeah. That guy. Key Kanye. West. Kanye, Kanye West. West. Yeah. I get his name mixed up. Kanye West came out and said abortion is wrong. Completely wrong. Just openly saying that it's wrong. And as Christians, we are to strive against that kind of sin. And that means voting. You know, that means voting uh, election day. And you vote uh, biblical principles if you are a Christian. Now, here's the balance. that If you are a Christian, Christians don't vote for abortion. That makes no sense. If we're for life and freedom, we vote against abortion. Okay? So that makes sense. But yet... God has given us the grace uh, so that we can vote uh, for or against. Now, he goes on and says for, in verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Isn't that amazing that God loves us enough to correct us, to correct us. Now, again, we're living in that day and age where we're tolerant. And so because we're tolerant of people so much, people are not um, receiving correction anymore because they don't want to hear correction. They don't want to hear what's wrong with them. And so as soon as you correct them, they get upset, angry, and they leave. They're gone. Now, God says, look, you should be rejoicing in the fact that you are getting corrected because it means I love you very much. Just as a parent loves his child, he won't allow his child to stick his hand in the fire. He won't allow his child to go play with those friends who are hoodlums. He won't allow his child to get involved in things on the video you know, game. And if it means taking his phone away, I'm going to take that phone away because I love you. I love you. So disciplining is tied in with loving so clearly, so, so clearly. And if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate sons. Now that's a scary place to be. If there is no chastening in your life, if God isn't correcting you, then the chances are you're not God's child because he's not concerned 
now with you. Only thing he's concerned about is that you turn to him and receive him as Lord and Savior. No, the enemy has you. <clears throat> you are his child, and he's letting you do whatever you want. That's a scary place to be. Even in the church, if I can say this, even in the church, sometimes people think this is, this is the right church here because everything's just going okay. Uh, everything is fine. We're not being corrected. There's no judgment. There's no divisions. There's no strives. There, nothing's going on at all. So we must be doing everything right. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Maybe God's not in it. And the devil's in it, and he's got you right where you need to be. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> there are churches today that, that ordain ministers, homosexuals as ordained ministers. <clears throat> and they feel that God approves of that. And so God hasn't chastised them. God hasn't corrected them. And so it must be okay because we're still here. We're still allowed to do it. The law's in our favors now. And so we're doing this. But that person is deceived because the Bible teaches the opposite. And really, ultimately, the Bible is our grid of truth. We go right back to the Bible and we read it and it tells us how we ought to live our lives. So just, just because... Things are going good without chastening. It doesn't mean that God's in it. You know, you look at the Mormon church, one of the biggest church, churches uh, in, in our world today, and yet it's a false church. It's a cult. It's considered a cult. It's not a Christian church. Uh, I don't care how many times uh, Mitt Romney says that he's a Christian. He's not a Christian. It's not a Christian church. Their doctrine on Jesus Christ is totally off. Look it up. Do some research, and you'll see that. The Lord chastens those whom are his and he loves. But if you're without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're an illeg illegitimate uh, son. You're not a son at all. Furthermore, uh, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Hopefully, you paid them respect. Maybe in the past you paid respect. This, is the, this generation is the most disrespectful generation ever. It's crazy how disrespectful people are today. Uh, again, that tolerance thing has gone to a total yeah. extreme now. <clears throat> Just total, total extreme. Uh, children are disrespectful to parents. Uh, they have no regard, no honor for them whatsoever because they're right. And they're right because Google says they're right. You know? And <clears throat> what was it that you posted on Facebook t today? Something like, uh, <clears throat> we said our, our world would not get better unless, unless uh, people had information, something like that. And now they got Google, and yet our world still isn't better. So information doesn't really make you better. It might make you feel like you're wiser and smarter, but it doesn't make you better. Only Jesus makes you better. <clears throat> Verse 10, They indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Why? Because he wants us to be holy as he's holy. And then he's, it's not talking about perfect here. Either. It's that you have a walk that's worthy of Christ. You're, you're surrendering and you are walking, striving to do the right thing every day. And, and that is what God wants. And he'll correct you when he needs to correct you. It's interesting how God does that. <clears throat> I've been in situations where I, I've gotten off the path. <clears throat> and I think that it's okay it might be a little stubbornness and rebelliousness and I'm just kind of getting away from things. But then God, all of a sudden, after some time, he just, things start happening that show you as you're on that path that it's not as good as you thought it was as the other path that you should have been on. And that there's still struggles there too. And then he starts shutting doors, closing relationships, and you're just like, what's going on? All of a sudden, he takes you from that, and he puts you back on the path. And you're like, how did he do that? And it was just like a process that he does, because he's correcting you. He's chasing you. He's the author and finisher of your faith. So he does that because he loves you. So no chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterward, it yields forward pe peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, again, uh, the next uh, verses here, 12 through 17, deal with renewing your spiritual vitality. Therefore, strengthen the hand which, which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the path of your feet so that what is lame will not be 
dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Wow. Isn't that interesting? You know what he's talking about there? Being born again. <clears throat> the pursue peace with all people and holiness. You can't pursue peace and holiness without being born again. Right? Without which no one will see the Lord. <clears throat> Nicodemus came to <clears throat> Jesus and said, I have a question for you. And Jesus said, look, Nick, you must, be born, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. That word see means to understand, to experience, to have full knowledge of the implications of what it means to have eternal life. It means a, a, a connection between you and the Holy Spirit that has revealed the truth to you. It, that's what the word see means here. And it's the same word that's being used by here. No one will see the Lord. So the only way you can see the Lord is by being born again. You must be born again. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace. How are you born again? By grace through faith. And it's not of yourself. Ephesians 2.8. Lest any root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble. And by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornication, fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Now, isn't that interesting how he lumps that with fornicator and profane? <laughs> and, and all he did was he sold his birthright. Sin is sin. Uh, and when you sell your birthright, which God gave to you, you're like fornicating. You're just giving it over to someone else because you have this idol in your life and you don't want to surrender to God. He sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessings, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Oh, that's scary, right? That is scary. But again, that's because there was no fruit in his life. You, you look at the life of Esau and you don't see any fruit at all. He did everything on his own. And without God, he never surrendered to the Lord. You know, and when he saw that uh, his birthright was taken from him, that's how he felt, by the way. He, it wasn't his fault. It was someone else's fault. It was Jacob's fault. Then he started crying, I want that birthright. I want that birthright. And too late. You already given it up. So now we come to the glorious company, verses 18 through 24. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, but to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so, much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. You know what he's talking about, right? The children of Israel, when they came to the mountain there, and they didn't go up into the mountain to see the fire. They were in darkness of the fire as it was burning, as it came down. And they could not dare touch the mountain. They feared, they trembled before the Lord. It was Moses who went up there on their behalf. And then he went on and said in verse 21, so terrifying uh, was that sight that Moses said, I exceedingly afraid and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So Abel's sacrifice was to make him righteous, right? It was the sacrifice of righteousness, what God required. Now we come to the end <clears throat> as we hear the heavenly voices. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting how there were angels as Moses was up there on the mount? It doesn't talk about that in the Old Testament, does it? But there was a host of angels there at the same time. So it must have been an amazing sight for Moses. Let's close, verse 25. That you see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall, be, shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, 
Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but the but also heaven itself. And he's talking about Jesus, right? The burning bush as he spoke and the mountain shook. Don't refuse his word. Don't refuse the Ten Commandments. Don't refuse what Jesus has said for, to us today. And it's going to shake again this mountain as he comes back for the church. <clears throat> now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Wow. <clears throat> our God is a consuming fire. The burning bush was a consuming fire that Moses was uh, speaking to. And so the reference is that that burning bush was God, right? Amen. <clears throat> and now you remember Moses asked the burning bush uh, as God gave Moses commandments to go back to Egypt. And Moses said, who shall I say sent me? Who sent me? Can, who am I going to, what am I going to tell them when they ask me, well, who sent you here? And the burning bush said, what? Tell them I am. I am. Say, I am that I am has sent me. And then we go to Roman or John chapter 8, I believe, when the fair, religious leaders were talking about <clears throat> Jesus and saying, who do you think you are? You know, we're of our father Abraham. We come from that lineage. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, he says, I am. And so the theophany that the burning bush was Jesus Christ, God, right there, clearly the Trinity so clearly, and he is a consuming fire. So is God a consuming fire today? Yes, he is. Is God a gracious God? Yes, yes he is. <laughs> He's both. Uh, do you want grace in your life or do you want to be consumed by fire? Simple. Surrender your life to God and he will have grace upon you. If you want a consuming fire, then be in rebellious against God and he will be correcting you and chastising you constantly you'll be miserable you might as well come back to the lord and just sit at his feet and be washed by his blood amen amen thank you for joining us guys if you have any prayer requests uh, post them there or private message me and we'll we'll pray for you we're going to take some time here and pray so god bless you have a wonderful weekend if you're in the neighborhood come by visit us here at uh, calvary chapel inland love to meet you god bless